The following presentation was made at the Advances in Geological and Geotechnical Data Handling and Modelling Conference at the Geological Society in October 2014. To enable you to get maximum resources out of this presentation, we've included a link in the description below that will give you more information on the topics covered and also explain some of the references made to previous presentations, companies and people within the conference. I hope you enjoy the presentation and it gives you lots to think about in the way that you will manage your data in the future. Don't forget, you can also subscribe to this YouTube channel to give you access to more geotechnical data management videos and training as we make them available. I hope you enjoy the presentation and if you've got any questions or any comments, please use the comments box below this video or if you prefer, get in contact with me with the details at the end of the presentation. So I've been given the topic to talk about collaborative tools uh, and what I wanted to do is really just emphasise how things have been changing over the last few years in the way that we are collaborating and working together and how they're set to change again probably in the next two to three to four years and give you an idea of what's gone on and what is going on. So here's a diagram that some of you may have seen if you've heard me talk before. Uh, this is what uh, myself and Rodney Hutchinson wrote in 1998, a paper called The Geotechnical Data Journey, talking about the use of AGS data back then. Um, and we were talking very much in case of you've got a seamless reporting if you're using AGS, but actually what most people have is a paper-based reporting system, or had, is a paper-based reporting system that at the end of every phase kind of gets printed out and then has to be retyped or re-entered in over here. The problem is, now, this was cutting edge when we did it 15 years ago, 16 years ago. The problem is now, we're not working like that anymore. We don't work in a straight line. And we'll see as we go through the presentation, the way that collaboration has come out and started to work dynamically between the members of the team within a project, is we don't do this, and then that, and then this, and then that. And we do all of these processes at the same time, all working alongside each other. So things are changing. And what you may notice is things are now changing faster than they've ever changed before. If you look at the rate of change, we're now increasing that graph considerably. And this rate of change has been driven by several things. First of all, we've got technology things that are driving us. Mobile technology. Well, it's, it's still quite difficult to believe that an iPad and tablet computer didn't really exist five years ago. And now they're selling millions of them almost every week. And everyone's got one. Everyone needs one. All of a sudden, we can't live without them. That's just five years. Um, it's interesting having a talk to my 12-year-old daughter the other day, who uh, we're going to change the, uh, the home computer. She can't understand why we want a desktop. Why would we want a computer that doesn't move? <laughs> That's just... It, she can't work it out. She's like, she's got her phone, she's got her tablet... Why would we want one that just stays there? What's that about? And you kind of think, hmm, things have changed, did not they? <laughs> things have changed, definitely. And this is having an effect on site, as Digby has already uh, shown today in the presentations. We've also got this thing that we refer to lovingly as the cloud technology. This is a great term that you can use to cover up almost anything and call it cloud technology. Uh, so let's bring it in. Uh, cloud computing. Uh, lots and lots of things. You are all probably using it right now in your projects at the moment, you'll be using it an awful lot more as things go on. And we'll talk about it as we go through the presentation in how you're probably currently using it, how things are being served to you via it, and how you might use it in the future. So these two things put together are changing the way we're thinking about moving and storing data. On a more practical down-to-earth level within our industry, we've got some documentation and some things that have really helped. First of all, to be mentioned already today with the new British standard, uh, for the code of practice. Um, that's helped people crystallise what it is they're trying to do and how they're going to do it. Um, it's a great read. It's very thin. You can do it very quickly. Uh, and one of the review comments we got back from it was, hmm, full of common sense. It's like, yes, it is. Were you doing it on the last project? Mm, no. <laughs> so it's, um, it, it almost teaches you to sort of suck eggs, but you read it and you think, do you know... We don't do that, and we don't do that. We should do that, okay? It's not very long. Obviously, UK uh, specification for ground investigation has been updated recently, as has the AGS for documentation. Now, this had the advantage, or disadvantage, depending on how you look at it, of coming out in the middle of a tough recession period, 
And although it came out in, as the document says there, October 2011, people are only just beginning to implement it. And this year has really been the year that AGS4 has raised its head. So have, if you haven't seen it yet, you will see it very soon. A couple of other things have happened over the last few years. Uh, data.gov.uk, or the open data policy from the government, has opened up all sorts of mapping data sets and information to us that we haven't had access to before, or if we have, we needed really big pockets and some experts to work out what to do with this massive pile of DVDs that's just arrived. When you take this technology and you combine it with this technology, web mapping services, you get something very powerful, which if you want, you can call cloud computing. You don't have to, because other people will just call it the internet. So when you combine that technology, and we look a bit more about how those two technologies merge in a minute, and you combine it with everything that's driving us, we're not allowed to do a presentation these days without mentioning BIM, we've said done it several times today already, this drive for sharing data throughout the project life cycle is driving us to collaborate better. And hopefully one day we'll even get the data to Digby's piling guys for the design. That's the ultimate thing at the moment because that's the really biggest hurdle that's already been brought up today that's going through. So let's just look at the way things are changing. This is an image that was uh, produced for our user group meeting last year uh, by one of our users at Mark McDonald's. And I thought it really summed up everything perfectly. They said, this is where we start. A 3D geological model in AutoCAD civils is what we start talking to our clients about. Because we find if we put the geology model on a 3D terrain model, both freely available data sets, the client understands the map. If we don't, we just give them a 2D map. He finds it very difficult to understand where, why the polygons are where they are and everything else. So they say, well, what we do is we do the 3D modelling. You could call it modelling. You could just call it 3D presentation. At the very beginning. So it's like, hold on a minute. That paper I wrote a little while ago was right at the very end. Now it's right at the beginning. They also say, well, we can take that one stage further and we can do very, very crude desk study 3D models. This is kind of what we expect to find, Mr. Client. Okay? Right at the beginning. Well, we wouldn't have done this till right at the end. And some of you may still not be doing things like this until right at the end. But the way the guys presented it at the user group meeting last year was really sort of got people thinking, hold on, things have really changed. So if we look at this now and we go, well, hold on a minute, our National Archive was at the bottom. We'll see in a minute it's now at the top. Our 3D modelling was at the bottom. We'll now see that that's at the top. We've kind of messed things up big time now with our collaboration. What is actually happening? And this is what it looks like now. We've got the data as our centre point for our collaboration. We've got our reporting at every stage as we go through. And then we've got prepare, investigate, test, analyse and interpret. And you'll probably find they're all running at the same time. So we need to collaborate. We need to find ways like... Um, Steve produced on his, on his airport there to work faster and quicker and share these information between each other. Let's look at some of those phases. Well, looking at prepare, the first thing you may want to do is look at your own company records. And it's surprisingly difficult, especially if Bill, the archive, is not in today, or the guy who's worked here longest, or the one who was on a job nearby is not in. But if you take the right systems and you put them in place, which are now readily available, you can literally have your desktop looking like that, which is every project you've worked on in the UK or anywhere else in the world. So your first point of call is what you know within your own building. Okay? If you're not utilising that, you've got something a bit wrong. The next phase is to look at the national available data sets. So here we have a screenshot from Holbase, and what we've got feeding into here, using web mapping services, using the open data technology from the government is Bing aerial photography, Bing mapping, the BGS borehole archive, and the BGS chemical data sets showing topsoil concentrations. All freely available data sets. All put into the back of our site investigation analysis programme. Now, with the use of web mapping services, I haven't got any DVDs in the post for any of this. I just ticked the box and it magically appeared. Okay. It's being served from the cloud 
or as we know it, the BGS server. <laughs> okay? So, and they're serving lots and lots and lots of data sets, as are the Environment Agency, as are the Ordnance Survey, that you can now just plug in, tick the box, and all of a sudden that thing that that GIS guy next to you has been telling you is really difficult, and that's why you employ B, just seems to be a turn of box on the data's there. Okay? That's collaboration between the BGS without even talking to them. So, really, really building up the collaboration at the beginning of the project, not just during it. Well, if you've got that kind of information, and you're going to position your boreholes anyway, usually on a piece of paper while you're sketching or something to work out where you're going to do it, why not do your site plans before your site work? If we're going to turn everything upside down, we might as well turn it completely upside down. Let's position our boreholes using our mapping data, and let's email the driller the instructions. That's what Digby's teams are doing with this key logbook. They can receive, you can email a driller. And when the driller gets the email, it goes, you've got new instructions. Drill here and here to this depth and do this. Fantastic. So now I'm looking at things and I'm thinking differently. I wouldn't do site plans until I got all the data. Obviously, when the data comes back, it may not be exactly where you put it. It will have its own coordinates. But you're starting to think and shuffling up. Of course, on site, we've heard a bit about this already. Um, we're not going to talk too much about this. Digby's covered it in a, in a, in a big presentation at the beginning. Okay. PDAs on-site are not new. Network Rail 2005, I think, was the uh, mention this morning. Highways mm -hmm. Agency been doing, doing the same thing. We launched this device that is using there in the year 2000. My gosh, 14 years ago. It's taking off now. <laughs> okay. Uh, just as you can't get PDAs anymore. Um, so it's not new, but it is being used extensively on-site and people have talked to it. Over the last 10 or 15 years, we've always been very keen to try and aim at the driller. Not in a million years is the quote that I always get from drillers, or did get until we started working with Equip and the stuff that uh, Norwest Hold, um, Soil Engineering, oof, slipped there nearly, um, and, and Digby's team are doing. And now you'll start to see these more and more in commonplace. This is one of the most popular things that we are selling at the moment uh, with Equip. And it's transforming it. All of a sudden, the drillers are on board. They're saving lots of time using these things, and to them, time is money. Now we're talking a language they understand. One of the things that comes out of it, if you want, is barcoding of samples. So that really helps collaborating with your laboratory and working with your laboratory in terms of getting the data to them. This is really important because people forget about data to the lab. And whenever I talk to a lab, I work with the majority of the labs here in the UK, and I say to them, they say, oh, we get asked for AGS data. And I said, right, from now on, whenever you get asked for AGS data, you ask for AGS data. Okay? If they want AGS data, they need to give it to you because it's their sample referencing, and then magically you can import it into your system without retyping it. Have you heard Roger's two rules, which have already been covered, so I won't cover those. Um, so... Get AGS data to your laboratory saves lots of problems. Now, it's brilliant because this has really taken off of AGS4, which includes scheduling as well. So we can now transfer our schedules electronically. And actually, as it happened, I was on the phone to a company yesterday who said, oh, that appointment we had was about four weeks ago now. And my scheduling stuff, brilliant. Got my first electronic schedule through today. Imported into KeyLab, no problem at all. It's absolutely brilliant. I love it. Okay. So the scheduling with the geotechnical lab is now happening. And it has been happening on a number of sites and a number of people who have got their own schedule sheets and everything else going out. But make sure you're scheduling electronically going forward. On stage even further, we're doing a webinar on this uh, tomorrow. Um, our control, the Atmos system for our control, now imports AGS4 data. So you can have data within whole base or whatever you want. You can export AGS data, put it straight into their limbs, and then schedule straight off. Okay. For them, it's a massive time saver because they haven't got someone entering all the sample data. For you, it's a massive time saver because you haven't got someone messing your data up. Okay. So you'll get back the data you gave them. So if it's messed up, it's your fault. But when you analyse the data, you want to look at it in all sorts of formats, and different people want to do it. So you need to be able to link it into whatever package you're going to do to analyse the rest of the data, albeit AutoCAD or whatever else it is you want to do. 
in actually plotting that data, visualising it and working and giving everyone within the project access to it in an environment they understand, in their environment. Okay? If they're an engineer, I can almost guarantee it's Excel. Okay? If it's in Excel, we're all happy. We're all a bit comfortable now. It's in Excel. Brilliant. Understand it. If you're a designer or a CAD guy, if it's in CAD, they're happy. They understand it. So it's the same data. It's just being transferred and moved interoperably between the systems. Don't force them to use your system, which they might think is clunky because it doesn't work in the way they work. Make sure that your data is available in the way they work and they'll be on board much, much quicker. And again, coming back to the principles of BIM, being able to share the data between systems. Think in 3D. Okay, this is where I get nervous because I have to get one of these videos to work, but uh, let's see if this works. Here we go, we're off. Right, this is real time thinking in 3D. I'm going to link my AutoCAD project into uh, my AutoCAD drawing into my project. What I'll then get is a site plan drawn up on the screen. In fact, all I've got in my 3D boreholes, I've got all my material types and everything else turned on, and I can visualise it from whatever angle and whatever way I want it. I can also go and I can turn on initial surface interpretation. I can do this with any project you've got, no matter how many boreholes, in roughly the same time. Okay? Now, if I can do this in that time, 23 seconds, for any project, I can now start to use this to think and not just present. We've got customers who are now going, this would be really useful for scheduling. Scheduling and testing, if I can display my samples against those boreholes, I can then do some sort of spatial looking as well as just looking down spreadsheets and sample schedules through this. And because now all of a sudden it's not something done at the end of that line, it's done something all the way between it, and any time that you've got 26 seconds free, you can get up an image like so. This isn't the final image. This isn't your working model. This is an initial interpretation which you can add engineering judgment to if you want to make that model better. Within things like this, um, this is done with the whole base extension for civils, but you can have the geotechnical module, which is a free download from Autodesk, which does the same thing. So Autodesk actually do a plugin that reads AGS data. Um, so you can turn it on its head and start to think more in 3D and more the way you're moving. This is an image, again, supplied, thank you, for, by Mark McDonald's, of an article that they did in Ground Engineering, uh, uh, sorry, in New Civil Engineer last year. And this really kind of brings everything together about the whole collaboration thing. Here, what we've got is a single model based on all disciplines. So we've got the structures guys, we've got the piling guys, we've got the geotechnical information all built in together. Now, this won't be just one drawing file or one modelling file. These geotechnical guys will be working on their below ground stuff, like we've just seen in the video. Everyone else will be working on their above ground stuff. And you can bring these components together as and when you want them. So you can look at what the structural guys are doing in terms of what you're trying to do underneath and vice versa. So do we need more site investigation because all of a sudden we've decided to move the building and now according to the uh, design rules or the SI rules we've got to do more sampling or whatever else it is. So if you can bring all of these components together into something that people look at this and they go, that's BIM, isn't it? It's like, no, that's an output from BIM. Um, that's an image that has been generated from the BIM process. Remember, BIM is a process, not a 3D model. So we can then go through and look at all that stuff and bring it all together. And if we can do that, then we're going to be collaborating extremely fast and very well in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, indeed. Roger, very positive and forward-looking presentation.